For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. If America's soul becomes totally false, those who have already begun to break the silence of the night have found that the calling to speak is often the vocation of agony. But we must speak. We must speak with all the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision. But we must speak. We must rejoice as well. For sure, this is the first time in our nation's history that a significant number of its religious leaders have chosen to move beyond the prophesying of smooth patriotism to the high ground of a firm descent based upon the mandates of conscience and the reading of history. Remarks of the President to the American Newspaper Publishers Association, Waldorf Astoria Hotel, New York City, April 27, 1961. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate very much your generous invitation to be here tonight. You bear heavy responsibilities these days, and the article I read uh, some time ago reminded me of how particularly heavily the burdens of present-day events bear upon your profession. All publishers will bear this lesson in mind. I hope all publishers will bear this lesson in the mind. The had already made it clear that it was not responsible for this administration. That it was not responsible for this administration. I want to talk about our common responsibilities in the face of a common danger. The events of recent weeks may have helped to illuminate that challenge for some, for some. but the dimensions some. of its threat have loomed large on the horizon for many years. Whatever our hopes may be for the future, for reducing this threat or living with it, there is no escaping either the gravity or the totality of its challenge to our survival and to our security. Two requirements that may seem almost contradictory in tone, but which must be reconciled and fulfilled if we are to meet this national peril. I refer first to the need for far greater public information. To the need for far greater public information. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. But I do ask, but I do ask every publisher, every editor, and every newsman in the nation to re-examine his own standards. Today no war has been declared, and however fierce the struggle may be, it may never be declared 
in the traditional fashion. Our way of life is under attack. Those who make themselves our enemy are advancing around the globe. The survival of our friends is in danger. And yet no war has been declared. No borders have been crossed by marching troops. No missiles have been fired. If the press is awaiting a declaration of war, before it imposes the self-discipline of combat conditions, then I can only say that no war ever posed a greater threat to our security. If you are awaiting a finding of clear and present danger, then I can only say that the danger has never been more clear and its presence has never been more imminent. It requires a change in outlook, a change in tactics, a change in missions by the government, by the people, by every businessman or labor leader, and by every newspaper. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I would be failing in my duty to the nation in considering all of the responsibilities that we now bear and all of the means at hand to meet those responsibilities if I did not commend this problem to your attention and urge its thoughtful consideration. On many earlier occasions I have said, and your newspapers have constantly said, that these are times that appeal to every citizen's sense of sacrifice and self-discipline. They call out to every citizen to weigh his rights and comforts against his obligations to the common good. I cannot now believe that those citizens who serve in the newspaper business consider themselves exempt from that appeal. I am asking the members of the newspaper profession and the industry in this country to re-examine their own responsibilities. I am asking the members of the newspaper profession and the industry in this country to re-examine their own responsibilities. Is it in the interest of national security? Is it in the interest of national security? Perhaps there will be no recommendations. Perhaps there is no answer to the dilemma faced by a free and open society in a cold and secret war. It is the unprecedented nature of this challenge that also gives rise to your second obligation, an obligation which I share. And that is our obligation to inform and alert the American people, to make certain that they possess all the facts that they need and understand them as well, the perils, the prospects, the purposes of our program, and the choices that we face. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. Tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. Without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. 
That is why the Athenian lawmaker Solon decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. It was early in the 17th century that Francis Bacon remarked on three recent inventions already transforming the world, the compass, gunpowder, and the printing press. Now the links between the nations, first forged by the compass, have made us all citizens of the world, the hopes and threats of one becoming the hopes and threats of us all. In that one world effort to live together, the evolution of gunpowder to its ultimate limit has warned mankind of the terrible consequences of failure. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. Heart of that concerns is where it has often loomed and large and loud. 
while you join the forces of dissent. Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. Aren't you hurting the cause of your people, they ask. And with, when I hear them, though I often understand the source of their concern, I'm nevertheless greatly sad. For such questions mean that the inquirers have not really known me, my commitment or my calling. Indeed, their questions suggest that they do not know the world in which they live. In the light of such tragic misunderstanding, I deem it of signal importance to try to stay clear. And I trust concisely I come to this platform tonight to make a passionate plea to my beloved nation. Tonight to make a passionate plea to my beloved nation. To make a passionate plea to my beloved nation. Life and history give eloquent testimony to the fact Conflicts are never resolved without trustful give and take on both sides. Since I am a preacher by calling, I suppose it is not surprising, nor is it an attempt to overlook the ambiguity of the total situation and the need for a collective solution to the tragedy that is at the outset of very obvious and almost facile connection between them, the struggle I and others have been waging in America. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. And I watched this program broken and eviscerated, as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor, so long as they get to draw men and skills and money, like some demonic destructive suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and to attack it as such. Perhaps a more tragic recognition of reality took place and it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and to die in extraordinarily high proportions relative to the rest of the population. So we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel iron. Watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same school. I cannot be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. My third reason moves to an even deeper level of awareness, for it grows out of my experience in the ghettos of the North over the last three years, especially the last three summers, as I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. They asked if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home, and I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed and the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. My own government. For the sake of those boys, 
for the sake of this government, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our bonds, I cannot be silent. For those who ask the question, are you a civil rights leader? And thereby mean to exclude me from the movement for peace. I have this further answer. In 1957, when a group of us formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, we chose as our motto to save the soul of America. We were convinced that we could not limit our vision to certain rights for black people, but instead affirmed the conviction that America would never be free or saved from itself until the descendants of its slaves were loose completely from the shackles they still wear. In a way, we were agreeing with Langston Hughes, that black bar of Harlem, who had written earlier, oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. It can never be saved so long as it destroys the deepest hopes of men the world over. So it is that those of us who are yet determined that America will be are allowed, are led down the path of protest and dissent, working for the health of our land. As if the weight of such a commitment to the right and health of America were not enough, this is a calling that takes me beyond national allegiances. But even if it were not present, I would yet have to live with the meaning of my commitment to me, the relationship of this ministry to the making of peace is so obvious that I sometimes marvel at those who ask me why I'm speaking against them. Could it be that they do not know that the good news was meant for all men, for communists and capitalists, for that children and ours, for black and for white, for revolutionary and conservative. They have forgotten that my ministry is in obedience to the one who loved his enemies so fully that he died for them. Beyond the calling of race, a nation, a creed, is this vocation of sonship and brotherhood. Because I believe that the father is deeply concerned especially for his suffering and helpless and outcast children. I come tonight to speak for them. I come tonight to speak for them. I come tonight to speak for them. This I believe to be the privilege and the burden of all of us who deem ourselves bound by allegiances and loyalties, which are broader and deeper than nationalism, and which go beyond our nation's self-defined goals and positions. We are called to speak for the weak, for the forceless, for the victims of our nation, for those it calls enemy. For no document from human hands can make these humans any less our brothers. Can make these humans any less our brothers. As I ponder the madness of and such within myself for ways to understand and respond in compassion. My mind goes constantly simply of the people who have been living under the curse of war for almost three continuous decades now, while we create a hell for the poor. Somehow this madness must cease. We must stop now. I speak as a child of God and brother to the suffering poor. I speak for those whose land is being laid waste, whose homes are being destroyed, whose culture is being subverted. I speak, of the, speak for the poor of America, who are paying the double price of smashed hopes at home, doubt, death, and corruption. I speak as a citizen of the world, for the world as it stands aghast at the path we have taken. I speak as one who loves America, to the leaders of our own nation. The great initiative in this war is ours. 
The initiative to stop it must be ours.